Hello, A Push Nation. Mr. Zagari here, and welcome to the latest edition of Content Spotlight, where we take and highlight a specific topic in one of our units and explain its importance and identify its broader historical connections and implications. Today, I will be discussing the assimilation of Native Americans into mainstream American culture throughout the case study of the Carlisle Indian School. All next on Content Spotlight. First, let's start with some context. As the United States was expanding from sea to shining sea, their political, social, and economic vision did not include the traditional tribal views of the diverse Native American cultures. American Indian policy was based on removing tribes to reservations in the Western territories. After the Civil War, more settlements in the Western lands would see a shift in United States policy towards Native Americans. By the latter part of the 19th century, the decimation of the buffalo, encroachment of white settlers on reservation land, and overall lack of motivation by the United States government has left American Indians in horrible living conditions. There is a political shift in American Indian policy towards now an assimilation. For those Native Americans that would assimilate, they would be granted protections from legislation like the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the 14th Amendment were at first purposely excluded from. In addition, the Dawes Act would be a political act that would force economic and social assimil assimilation by breaking up tribal and reservation lands and subdividing them into plots for homesteads to farm on. Working in tandem with the well-intended reformers of the Dawes Act, the U.S. government began to set up assimilation schools to, as then Secretary of War George McRae would argue, save the soon-to-be extinct culture and bring up a class of young men who will be leaders of their people in taking away from the chase and war. The Carlisle Indian School opened its doors in 1879 under the direction of the federal government and the jurisdiction of the Department of the Interior. In charge of the institution would be Richard Henry Pratt, who was a captain in the United States Army and whose experiences in the Indian Wars had propelled him to the superintendent of the institution. The Carlisle School would be one of many schools that would work to assimilate young Indian children into mainstream American culture. The goal of the military-style schools would be, as Pratt would report, that all the Indians there in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. Pratt believed that the United States had the responsibility to, quote, transfer the savage-born infant to the surroundings of civilization and he will grow to possess a civilized language and habit, unquote. The assimilation began with killing the Indian. When students arrived at the school, they were immediately given haircuts and given American names. Notable historian, author, and American Indian educator, Luther Standing Bear, described his name change at the school. I was told to take a pointer and select a name from the list on the blackboard. This process was the start at removing any sense of American Indian cultural identity from the student. For Standing Bear, it was losing his given Lakota name of Oti Kati, or Plenty of Kill. Carlisle was organized in a militaristic style, including physical abuse when necessary. Students had to give up their cultural identity. The curriculum was not confined to traditional academics. Carlisle would immerse students into mainstream white American culture with teachings in American music and athletics. Indian children would learn American-style instruments and play pieces from popular American composers of the time. Compositions like Stars and Stripes Forever by John Philip Sousa, 1896, were common on music stands at Carlisle. Composers like Sousa would have a two-fold approach in the curriculum. It would be used as a teaching tool for American music, but moreover, be used in teaching a sense of American patriotism. Additionally, athletics were used in the Americanization process as sports like football and track and field were used to promote patriotism. Jim Thorpe was a graduate of Carlisle and won gold, medal, gold medals in the Olympics and is also in the Football Hall of Fame. 
While the progressive nature of the assimilation process of the United States government may have had good intentions, the outcome of it was disastrous to Native American culture. Now let's look at some historical themes. While the Carlisle School can fall under several themes, let us look at politics and power and American and regional cultures. With politics and power, we see the U.S. governmental policy towards Native Americans shift. The U.S. began to adopt a policy of assimilation, as before mentioned, their policy of more removal. The policy of assimilation would be seen in the military-style schools that fell under the jurisdiction under the Department of the Interior, as well as legislation such as the Dawes Act, which looked to break up reservations for allotments of land to be worked on into homesteads. For American and regional cultures, the United States took on a paternal approach towards American Indians during this time period in their view um, that the government felt that they, they were doing what they felt was best for them. This is noted in an 1888 Supreme Court case of U.S. versus Claypox, where the Supreme Court ruled that, and I quote, the Claypox decision recognized that courts of Indian offenses were educational and disciplinary to be used by the United States to control and shape the culture of tribes under the United States guardianship. Now let's connect to a different time period, or as our friends at College Board like to call it, reasoning. This notion of American paternalism is also replicated during this time period on the foreign policy front with the age of imperialism. With the American victory in the Spanish-American War, the U.S. gained control over the Philippines. Here we have President McKinley discussing the U.S. policy towards the Philippines. And I quote, When I next realized that the Philippines had dropped into our laps, I confess I did not know what to do with them. I sought counsel from all sides, Democrats as well as Republicans, but got little help. That we could not leave them to themselves. Speaking about the Filipinos. They were unfit for self-government and they would soon have anarchy and misrule over their over there worse than Spain. And lastly, there's nothing left for us to do but to take them all and to educate the Filipinos and uplift a civilize and civilize and Christianize them and by God's grace do the very best we could by them as our fellow men for whom Christ also died. Clearly we see the notion of American paternalism towards the people of the Philippines similar to the well-intended reformers towards the American Indians, the United States is trying to step in and assimilate the Filipinos to the American idea of government and Western society. Thanks for joining us, and please check out our unit reviews, writing highlights, and of course, a push on the road. This is Mr. Zagari. Keep on keeping on.